Yay! A jumping puzzle. Would you look at that? I love jumping puzzles. As far as video games go that let you move backwards while holding down the left mouse button, I'd say the Serious Sam franchise is practically unmatched. Developed by Crow Team, with the first game coming out way back in 2001, it's a series that's become well known for its chaotic action, frenzied shooting and large expansive environments, throwing you in the middle of a literal desert as enemies often spawn in every single possible direction and then beeline towards your position. Now, tracking the games in the series is actually kind of confusing because there's been so many spin-offs and sequels that it often gets lost up its own ass. But the main entries in the series were the first and second encounter in 2001, then Serious Sam 2 in 2005, Serious Sam 3 in 2011, and now the upcoming Serious Sam 4 in, hopefully, 2020. It's the spin-off games, though, where it starts to get a bit interesting. A lot of these not even being developed by Crow Team, but by different developers entirely. Like Serious Sam for the Game Boy Advance, Serious Sam Kamikaze Attack for Android and iOS, and case in point, Serious Sam Next Encounter the GameCube and the PlayStation 2, which came out in 2004, developed by Climax Solent. Yeah, I've got some big balls. These guys have got a knack off for spin-offs, apparently having worked on Silent Hill Origins, Silent Hill Shattered Memories, and probably their greatest game to date, SpongeBob SquarePants Super Sponge for the PlayStation. Yeah, wow. The next encounter, though, has the pretty unique moniker of being one of the few console-only versions of a Serious Sam game having an entirely unique campaign, weapon, and enemy lineup from the PC versions, even if it does just kind of steal things a bit here and there to keep things thematically similar. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole rigmarole of which version is better here, the GameCube or the PlayStation 2. There's a really good video by another YouTuber named Frame Raider who goes into great detail on the differences between each port. And I've got to give a big shout out to this guy for also helping me to get this game running. So look, if you're interested in which version beats the other one out, then go watch that. I'll even put a link to it in the video comments because that's just the kind of guy I am. But I will say that if you choose to play the GameCube version, you're able to play this one on the PC with a Dolphin emulator with a mouse and a keyboard. And I don't think I need to tell you that playing this thing with a mouse and a keyboard is far superior to the controller. Yeah, I've got some big balls. When it comes to the gameplay though, both of these versions are pretty much the same. So what you say about one port pretty much carries across to the other. I think I'd say the game that it closely resembles the most is Serious Sam 2, mostly because it's got that same wacky Saturday morning cartoon tone, though it has been dialed down a fair bit here. What's interesting though is that this game came out before Serious Sam 2, so I don't know, I guess Serious Sam 2 was taking its influence from this then? I mean, who came first here? The chicken or the cancer infested egg? Here you'll explore ancient Rome, China, the lost city of Atlantis, and then a spaceship that's like something out of a two-rock game. Still though, feeling mostly like the tone of the first game, being a bit more gritty and realistic, and less cartoonish. Aside from this bit here though, which I don't even know how to describe, let's just call it the Vomit Bridge. Then you've got this level where every room has a different center of gravity. It's a bit of a testament to how good the texture work in this game is and that it still looks really good when you run it through an emulator. Some of the environments just look amazing, especially some of the ones you come across when you get to Atlantis. You got your fair share of empty deserts, but it does a good job of mixing things up for each of the locations and the texture work still shines through even 16 or so years later. Gotta say that I kind of feel sorry for video game artists from back then who had to work on these console exclusives because all of their talent and hard work got covered up by crappy resolutions and blurry visuals. Go play a game like James Bond Nightfire and you'll see what I mean. Hi. Well, at least now in 2020, we can finally appreciate it properly. With the enemies, you're not taking on witches flying around on broomsticks, ogre footballers or clowns on unicycles. Though the Harpies do now look like cheerleaders that have had their faces smashed in with a cricket bat, so I don't really know what to make of that. Probably one of the biggest differences between this and the first couple of games on the PC is the scoring system and how combos work. Right, so every time you kill an enemy now, the combo meter goes up by 1, and when it reaches 20, you then activate a kind of super combo mode, where Sam starts moving around at double speed, and during all of this, killing enemies earns you double the amount of usual points. Yeah! This lasts for about 10 seconds, finishing with an annoying high-pitched siren because picking the most annoying sound possible for something you're going to be hearing a hundred times is a good idea. Then the counter resets and you're back to zero. In 
lieu of having lives, now what happens is that when you die, you instead just lose a bunch of points off your total score, which at the end of the level then reflects negatively on what ranking you get, either bronze, silver, or gold. Get enough gold medals and then you can unlock and play through some of the hidden levels, some of which are so challenging, they're the kind of thing that helps to really build character. If you end up losing all of these points though, then it's a game over, but honestly I think you'd actually have to want to make this happen, because generally I think this whole thing is pretty piss easy, up until the last couple of levels anyway when it actually starts to become challenging. When you get to all of the weapons, it's mostly the same as the other games, just with a few minor differences. For starters, you've still got Sam's Chainsaw, which comes in handy with some of the weaker enemies, but is really just about as useful as shit-flavoured toothpaste the rest of the time. Instead of Sam's revolvers, you've now got Desert Eagles, and you start with two of these things right off the bat. They function pretty much the same as the revolvers though, and it is kind of interesting seeing this gun in the game, considering it would later go on to be one of the starting weapons in Serious Sam 3. Next, you've got a couple of dual Uzis, similar to the submachine guns in Serious Sam 2, and about the same mechanically as the Tommy guns in the first game. They've got a super high firing rate and they seem to do pretty decent damage, at least early on anyway. And I love the way Sam holds them to the side during sustained gunfire like some kind of time traveling gangster. The superior version of this weapon though is the returning champion, the goddamn minigun, son. Something of a staple for the series and a definite workhorse weapon. Minigun, maximum pleasure. In fact, if you don't spend the majority of the game using this thing with your finger firmly pressed down on the R2 button, well, I gotta tell you, you're playing the game wrong. What is kind of interesting too is that they've removed the standard shotgun from the game and just included the coach gun by itself, which is now also a lot more accurate at range. You can actually shoot someone with this thing without needing to be close enough to see if they've been using that shit flavored toothpaste. I think it also does more damage as well, it seems to be able to finish off those charging wear balls in a single shot now. And same thing with the clears, and being able to kill either of those enemies faster is an objectively good thing, because they suck. The rest are just redesigned or reskinned versions of the other weapons, you've got the rocket launcher, still awesome, the grenade launcher, still shit, sniper rifle and then the flamethrower. The only real new weapon is the Syrian power gun you get near the end of the campaign, which kind of looks like something out of a Turok game. But it makes up for it by melting through enemies, or is that zapping through enemies? Especially those annoying Atlanteans, which might be one of the worst inclusions to the enemy lineup. Oh yeah, let's not forget the goddamn cannon. A few games out there let you carry around your very own personal artillery cannon. There's always been something so appealing about this weapon, I don't know, maybe it's the fact that you're carrying around something with your bare hands that looks like it should be on the side of a brigantine. You ever seen those videos where there's a girl in a sports car and her cleavage is bobbing around from all the vibration? Yeah? Well, that's what firing this thing is like. Speaking of cars, you get to drive one a couple of times in the game too, though sadly it kind of handles like a broken shopping cart with extreme oversteer. But it is kind of cool seeing a vehicle in a Serious Sam game, again ahead of the curve before Serious Sam 2 would do it a year later. What really makes these weapons unique though and also one of the game's standout features is that you've got alternate ammo types for most of these as well. And correct me if I'm mistaken Sunny Jim, but I think this is the only game in the series that ever did this. The flamethrower for instance can be equipped with cryo gas which freezes enemies solid causing them to shatter a few seconds later. I'd even argue that the mechanic of being able to freeze enemies in a first person shooter is one that's always been awesome, all the way back to doing it in Hexen. The rocket launcher now has homing rockets and also sonic rockets, gotta go fast, which sends out a mini shockwave after impact, kind of like a fat kid dive bombing into a kiddie pool. With the Uzi you get ricocheting rounds which bounce all over the place and have the added bonus of being absolutely fucking useless. And perhaps the most broken of all, the minigun has homing bullets where you just don't even really need to aim. Just fire into the air like your Keanu Reeves at the end of Point Break and then watch those bullets magically redirect in midair and find their target. Also a perfect ammo type for the Serious Sam player who's playing the game with one hand. <laughs> One thing I did notice too on the PlayStation 2 version is that at the end of each level, for some reason, the game resets all of your ammo. You could end a level with 50 rockets and 80 shotgun shells, but come the next level, you're back to 5 rockets and 10 shells. 
At the end of each episode, you lose all of your weapons, but this at least in some way makes sense because Sam is hopping into a time traveling portal at the end of each episode. So it's kind of like the time portal in the Terminator films, you know what I mean? You can't take any weapons with you. I get it. In fact, if Sam started each chapter completely nude, I'd be totally fine with that too. Imagine that too, Sam just appearing naked in an empty desert surrounded by clears. Do you think he'd be embarrassed? I'm asking for a friend. You're probably wondering how the whole thing handles with a controller, and yeah, that's a fair question. The fact of the matter is that playing first-person shooters with a controller just isn't the ideal way to play it. Despite what that kid who spent 900 hours on Modern Warfare 3's multiplayer mode is ever going to tell you. Well, surprise surprise though, here it actually works kind of well. And the default control scheme is pretty tight, at least on the PS2 anyway. I've always thought the PlayStation 2 controller is one of the single best controllers ever designed for console gaming, aside from maybe the SNES controller. It's like a natural beauty, the Jennifer Connelly of video game controllers. It looked good back in the day, and it still kinda looks good now. The GameCube controller, however, is like a plastic surgery botched to bimbo in comparison. I mean, look at this thing. Looks like it belongs in a contemporary art museum. Alright, alright, calm down Nintendo fanboys, I'm only kidding. It doesn't belong in a museum. It belongs in the trash. The way they've worked around the shooting handicap is by giving you an incredibly generous auto-aim system and thank the FPS gods they did this. Console shooters without auto-aim are about as fun as bobbing for apples in a public toilet. Another thing is that the environments in this game, like the entire series to be honest, are usually just across some kind of flat open surface. And most enemies are always going to be on the same level as the player. Occasionally you'll get flying enemies or someone perched up on the side of a cliff somewhere throwing projectiles at you like a complete asshole. but most of the time combat is at eye level with Sam, meaning all you've really got to do is aim left and right as opposed to up and down. You know something, I never really noticed the lack of verticality these games had until I started playing this game. I even went back and played some of the earlier Serious Sam games and they're all pretty much guilty of this to some extent. I mean, it does get some degree of variety with flying enemies like the Harpies, but it does become really repetitive. Speaking of repetitive, get ready to shoot the same looking enemies a few thousand times. I mean, it wouldn't be a Serious Sam game if you didn't get to take on absolute legions of beheaded soldiers. And they're about as smart and intelligent as you can expect for an enemy that's missing their head. In case you were mourning the absence of the kamikaze guys, well, don't worry. They're back and in total abundance. I can't remember when it started that the Serious Sam games just had to keep throwing these things at you in total abundance. I mean, if my memory's correct, they did it pretty sparsely in the first game. But it seems that after that, they just became a lot more common. I guess the consolation is that at least they do make their presence known. Instead of the Nars, now you've got these little heads with sharp teeth and arms called dum-dums. And you'll see a flying variant of these things as well, which kind of sounds like a little tiny combat chopper chasing after you. By far the most annoying additions though are the Atlanteans. Now these are those Turok looking enemies that just constantly spam these plasma balls at you. Harpies also make a return though, now they've taken a serious beating from the ugly stick. Then there's also the return of the Biomechanoids, Arachnoids, Reptiloids and Clears. Though taking a page out of Serious Sam 2, the Clears are now a bit more nerfed, making them much more manageable. Honestly, I'm amazed that I even enjoy playing these games sometimes considering how this lineup of enemies is the most consistently annoying bunch of pricks in any video game. Reptiloids alone are irritating, but combined in the same area with clears, kamikazes and werebulls, I mean it's just like one big shit cocktail. What the hell are you supposed to be? Then we've got the boss fights, and these are interesting. And the next encounter has three of these. The first one being the mighty Diablo Tor, a giant minotaur with guns coming out of his back and arms. And some attacks that I think make him one of the toughest bosses in the entire franchise. A few of this guy's attacks are pretty much unavoidable unless you're a certain distance away from him, but even then, when he gets low on health, he'll start doing this thing where he charges towards you like you're some unfortunate matador. Most annoyingly, you're also dealing with other enemies in the arena as well, as well as randomly spawning in beheaded kamikazes. The second boss is even better. Now, this thing is three heads that pop up from the ground, each with a different attack style. Then once it drops down to half health, all three heads pop out and attack you at once. Let me just say, if you're going to play this, take out the fire one first, because this asshole can literally kill you in two hits. You have to finish all of these fights in a single life too, because every time you die, you start from the beginning. Still though, on some weird level, these boss fights are probably the best parts of the entire game because if nothing else, at least you're not just mindlessly killing the same enemies for the 50th time. 
Having said that, I mean, you can't really fault the game for that. Serious Sam games have always been about shooting the same enemy over and over. It'll be like jumping into a swimming pool and complaining about getting wet. The only times the level design really suffers here is when it doesn't play to its own strengths. Serious Sam really thrives when you're just put into a giant stadium-sized arena and given free reign. And the reason this works is because you're given complete autonomy when it comes to avoiding and killing enemies. But the moment the level design tries to break away from that is when it starts to suffer. I'm talking about smaller interior areas like the inside of buildings and some of the worst defenders of all, narrow hallways and tunnels. The third episode, for instance, starts off with you moving through the bottom of these tall canyons as you make your way to the lost city of Atlantis. And it's kind of dope visually, but it's just bottleneck after the bottleneck, without that many options for horizontal maneuverability. These are the moments when it stops becoming a fun game to play and it just starts to feel like a chore. If Serious Sam had a real-life occupation equivalent, it'd be manual labor. This is the video game version of digging ditches, lifting up hay bales and lugging around timber. You've got to fight, grind, and work for every single thing you earn in this game. You're constantly on the back foot, facing insurmountable odds, being swarmed by dozens of enemies and struggling to stay alive. And it is a constant battle that knows no end. I mean, poor Sam. The man can't even pick up so much as a health kit or a bag of ammo without getting pounced on like some kind of drunken cougar at a nightclub. But here's the kicker, and the thing that I don't think many people are willing to admit, which is that the Serious Sam games are inevitably boring. There's no better example of diminishing returns in a video game than this. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's incredibly high octane and action packed, and it's fun stuff in short stints, it really is. But it just gets so repetitive the more you keep playing because aside from the background changing, there really is nothing to differentiate any of this as you progress. So when you start playing the first level right up until the last, you always know what the game is going to throw at you. It's kind of like Groundhog Day. If you had infinite minigun ammo, I'd even argue you could finish the entire thing by just holding down the R2 button the entire time. Considering how far we've come with games like Doom Eternal recently, where you've got different weapons working for better or worse against different enemies. Enemies with different attack patterns and so many options for the player's mobility and movement. I mean, something like Serious Sam now in 2020 feels more archaic than ever. That's why even though the game only lasts 7 hours, it may as well be 70 hours, because that's kind of what it feels like. I trudged through a level that felt like it went on forever, only to find that it lasted barely 15 minutes. I'm actually kind of interested to see how they deal with this with the upcoming Serious Sam 4. If it's just going to be the same old formula with a better looking engine, that kind of gameplay is going to get old real quick. As far as Next Encounter is considered though, for a Serious Sam game carried across to the console, this thing is downright black magic. And the elements in the gameplay, like the vehicles and some of the tonal stuff they'd later implement in Serious Sam 2, is impossible to ignore. It's light-hearted, colourful fun from a time in gaming where protagonists didn't need to feature in graphic sex scenes. About the worst thing you've got to look at here is the fugly face of an approaching harpy. Yeah, I've got some big balls. <laughs> <laughs> 